Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me uh, get us started here. My name is Paul Pope. I am a professor of practice in the LBJ School and a senior fellow in the Intelligence Studies Project, uh, which is sponsoring this talk today. The Intelligence Studies Project is in turn sponsored by the Robert Strauss Center and the Clement Center for National, National Security. Um, we're honored today to be joined by Dr. Seth Jones. Dr. Jones is the Harold Brown Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. He's also the director there of the Transnational Threats Project and a senior advisor in CSIS's International Security Program. Prior to joining CSIS, uh, Dr. Jones was the director of the International Security and Defense Policy Center at the RAND Corporation. He also served with U.S. Special Operations Command as a plans officer and as advisor to the commanding general, U.S. Special Ops Forces in Afghanistan, which is actually where Seth and I first met in, uh, in 2009. We didn't have the, the long association I wanted to because I was injured by being suckered into playing basketball with a, uh, a young person. Um, <laughs> Dr. Jones specializes in, in counterterrorism, counterinsurgency, unconventional warfare, and covert action, including a focus on Al Qaeda and ISIS. And I've read many articles that he's written over the years. He's also the author of a number of books, Waging Insurgent Warfare in 2016, Hunting in the Shadows, The Pursuit of Al-Qaeda after 9-11 in 2012, and In the Graveyard of Empire, Empires, America's War in Afghanistan in 2009. Um, today we're, we're here to discuss his most recent book, A Covert Action, Reagan, the CIA, and the Cold War Struggle in Poland. I'm not up there anymore. And I'm not going to talk too much about the book because I want him to, but it's, it's a book that examines a, a fairly little-known story of CIA operations in Poland, uh, which contributed to uh, sustaining solidarity, solidarity through some, some dark days um, when the Soviets wanted to, to crush this, um, this budding movement. Um, I'm not going to tell you too much about it, but I think it's been long overlooked by historians. One of the points that we've been talking about today is this wealth of declassified material that's beginning to come, that's beginning to come out and the need for historians to, to dive into that and to uh, sort of update some of our stories that we've had. I would just note for you as we go in, one more thing about the program that's interesting is it was a it was relatively uh, small size and it was completely non-lethal. But anyway, I think you're, you're in for a great talk and Seth, uh, join me in welcoming Seth Jones. Thanks for the invitation to come here. It's good to see a range of uh, both uh, old friends and new friends. Uh, it is nice to get outside of Washington. I really mean it is nice to get outside of Washington, D.C. What I'd like to do here is uh, to walk through a program that takes us back to the Cold War, but I, as I hope you see by the end of this session, has some notable implications for today. What I'm going to walk you through is the information environment first in the late 1970s and 1980s, right around the time, the end of the Carter administration and the early part of the Reagan years, where uh, as Reagan comes into office, he and his intelligence community correctly assess that they are being hammered overseas by an aggressive uh, Soviet Union that is conducting what we'll go through in a moment, uh, active measures against the U.S. globally. And, and what you'll see is, a, is one component of a much broader effort to recognize the importance not just of military power, conventional nuclear diplomacy, development, but also of information, where hmm. this administration elevates the role of information up to and, and, and ideas uh, up to a key instrument of American power. And the program that we're going to look at is, which has up to now not been in any meaningful way, shape, or form publicly acknowledged, uh, was a, a program not designed to provide weapons, the, as was the case in Afghanistan, where the U.S. provided weapons and, and lethal material, including the Stinger sting missiles, to the Mujahideen. But, but to provide money to fund and, and help, uh, help organize an underground movement whose goal was newspapers and, uh, and uh, radio broadcasts and television networks, it turns out, 
where it is entirely a political program designed to help a democratic movement in a state where it's being suffocated. And so it's an interesting case study of the U.S. administration choosing to help a budding democratic movement survive, although it does more than just survive, as we'll see by the end of it. But before getting into what the U.S. did, I thought it would be helpful as a reminder to take a quick look at where we were as the administration comes in in the 1980s. And as a reminder, uh, we have a deep division in Europe between the, the West and, and NATO and Warsaw Pact countries in the East. Um, what we have across the board and it's global in scope is what we call, uh, what, what they call, what the Russians call an active measures campaign. This is different from espionage operations, which would collect information on what the U.S. was doing, steal it, um, to get a better understanding of what the U.S. Uh, military was doing in procuring weapons. This was about influence, and almost entirely about influencing populations, whether it was domestically in the U.S. or overseas, in ways that both benefited Moscow and also undermined the U.S. And the, the U.S. was, without a doubt, probably much like today, was the main enemy of the Soviet Union. It's what KGB said, matter of factly, it was their primary and number one adversary was the United States. And so this component in what we're talking about in active measures run by KGB's Directorate A uh, was a campaign designed to uh, influence populations covertly. That is, without the knowledge public knowledge and awareness that this was the KGB that was providing the assistance, the planning, and other aspects of the program. So uh, what active measures uh, looked like was a couple of things. First, it was the creation of front companies. So if you think about this for a moment, if you're, uh, if you're either living in the United States or Western Europe, you know that there are organizations like communist parties. And you can probably guess rightly so, that they have a connection with the Soviet Union at that point, and, and, are, and are largely sympathetic. But what about organizations like the World Peace Council, which, as, as you thumb through its brochures, it's, uh, it's got offices across Western Europe. As you thumb through its brochures, it is pretty straightforward, dedicated towards uh, the end, or at least the decrease in nuclear weapons. And where its focus may be on, as the U.S. is debating whether to put a theater of nuclear forces into Western Europe, it is opposing those pretty matter-of-factly through conferences, through uh, publications, and through uh, outreach to uh, news media. Well, it turns out, in this case, that the World Peace Council, as was outed uh, a couple of years after its creation, was funded by uh, the KGB that it was a front organization which appeared to be a non-governmental organization. Instead, it was a front for influence. And we see that with other organizations, we, or, or other types of active measures, the covert broadcasting of radio and other, other um, uh, kinds of programs. We see that with disinformation campaigns, and I'll show a couple of examples of that in a moment. And then of conducting assassinations. And here, the assassinations are designed for influence purposes, so these are uh, KGB defectors who have come to the West that will be targeted for assassination. They may be Soviet, um, uh, you know, uh, academics that have relocated to the West and are writing documents, books, articles that are targeting Marxism, Leninism in a way that are uh, the Soviets view as threatening, uh, either assassination or intimidation. So these are multiple, multiple forms. And actually, before I move on, what's interesting to, is to see Casey as he becomes the CIA's director in 1981, so Reagan's first year in office, says as, and remember, Casey had, had been sort of at the beginning of this, an OSS officer in Europe at the end of World War II, where he had seen this transition, at least from a US standpoint, of having to focus on the Nazis and now recognizing that the Soviets might pose a threat. So he's been dealing with the Soviets really from World War II on, 
And he says at this point, most of these active measures are not new, recognizing that it's list, since the period of Stalin and Lenin and others that the Soviets have been doing things along these lines. But that the techniques that, are, that have been used, uh, they're being used with more effect or sophistication now by the current Soviet state. So not anything new per se, but the, just the degree and the amount of money they're putting in about $4 billion in 1981, in 1981 money into active measures which, which heavily outspends what the US is spending on these kinds of activities. So it's taking it seriously. This is a declassified CIA document uh, that shows the difference between what we're talking about here, which is uh, covert uh, Soviet KGB influence efforts and its overt ones through TAS and other, other economic assistance or military assistance programs. So in addition to the front groups, you also see agents of influence. They would include either the direct recruitment of journalists, which they did. France, for example, had a major journalist uh, that had been recruited by the KGB and then went on for uh, a long period of time writing newspaper articles that were very sympathetic to the Soviet until he was arrested in, uh, in, uh, for espionage. Um, we also saw KGB agents posing as journalists uh, or, or uh, Eastern European intelligence agencies posing as journalists. So that's how the agents of influence operates or that they're putting uh, academics or others on the payroll of the organization. So you see with all of these activities, forgeries, placement of articles, all the way down to agents of influence, these are covert attempts to influence populations. So a couple of examples that are, are worth noting. This on the left side is a document um, uh, that, was, that was used as an advertisement in a number of Western magazines around the time where the US and NATO forces were talking about increasing uh, theater nuclear forces in Western Europe. And so this was a World Peace Council advertisement. It looks like it's a non-governmental organization opposing new nuclear uh, missiles into Europe on the grounds of what looks like on the surface a left of center peace movement it turns out to be KGB funded, so slightly different. The second on the right side is probably the most effective disinformation campaign of the Cold War. It starts off as a Soviet, as a KGB plant in an Indian newspaper. It's a, it's a letter to the editor from an anonymous um, I believe he's a U.S. scientist, and he was outing a program that turns out to be fictitious at Fort Detrick, Maryland, that had produced and that either accidentally or purposefully let out the AIDS virus, which was infecting individuals in places like Africa. So this, the the, the way active measures works, and active is an important term because it's it's a uh, it's it's meant to indicate that. Soviet plants, in this case, in newspapers and magazines, if they succeed, will take on a life of their own. And that's what happens with the KGB AIDS campaign. It's, a, it's an initial letter that eventually gets picked up and purposely gets picked up in, in the uh, mostly first Soviet press. Uh, and they're reporting on the anonymous letter. And then it gets picked up in uh, Czechoslovak, East German press, all state run, all done with the coordination of intelligence services, and then begins to take on a life of its own. Because it's now coming out in multiple sources, Western European newspapers start to publish uh, stories about the AIDS virus potentially being uh, or originating in the United States in US laboratories, which, which is a fictitious story. And what becomes interesting is by the end of the 1980s and even the early 1990s, we have numerous public opinion polls being done, not just in Africa, but in the United States, where in the US there's a great um, uh, story in, I can't remember if it's the Journal of American Medicine uh, or, or another one, it's by a group of RAND researchers, a public opinion poll, showing extraordinary numbers of African Americans in the U.S. believing that the AIDS virus was um, was produced in U.S. laboratories, including potentially military laboratories. 
This originates as a KGB disinformation campaign. It has gotten traction globally, uh, but I think as anybody who's dealt with AIDS in the medical community uh, knows, matter of factly, uh, that is not where AIDS came from. So we see pretty successful efforts. We also see, this is a this is a, a NSC staffer, John Lutsowski, uh writing a piece in the 1980s on Soviet intervention in the US electoral process. The Soviets were particularly aggressive against uh, Reagan, who they deemed as deeply anti-Soviet, and attempted uh, a bit to push back against him in the 80 elections, and then went after him wholesale in 1984, went after Nixon as being anti-Soviet. For the Soviets, the influence, uh, influence campaigns for elections, this is why the debate today about the 2016 election, uh, they've been attempting to influence, I mean, there was a period after the collapse of the Soviet Union where we did see a major drop off because they had internal issues to deal with. Um, but at least during the Cold War, a uh, lot of evidence uh, that we now know from the CIA and FBI declassified documents attempts to manipulate, including one case actually offering money, uh, funding, uh, major funding to the uh, Democratic presidential candidate for office in an American election. A Soviet straight up offered cash. So we've seen uh, disinformation campaigns and money uh, in, in past campaigns. What begins to happen as Reagan gets elected is uh, we start to see a notable change in Eastern Europe. And the timing, I think, is more of a coincidence than anything else. In 1980, the, what starts off as a budding trade union solidarity uh, reaches an agreement with the Polish regime to establish independent self-governing trade unions. So there is, there's already uh, an organization or a series of organizations in Poland that center around, this is the Gdansk shipyard, which builds ships, so blue collar building of ships in Poland, but it also includes uh, individuals that are working in mines and other locations that have been pushing for more uh, independence and self-governing of those trade unions outside of the Communist Party. So they're able to negotiate a, uh, an agreement which legalizes solidarity in 1980 as an independent self-governing trade union. Well, it makes Moscow deeply concerned because they see the possibility of a democratic government uh, or a, a democratic organization beginning to form in Poland. And it's organized. And it's organized because the labor unions are at their core organized. And by 1981, there are 10 million members of Solidarity. So uh, they're led by <coughs> Lech Wałęsa, who is charismatic. He doesn't oversee all of Solidarity. His, he's based out of the shipyard in Gdansk. <coughs> but you see these growing demonstrations, and they start to protest on the streets of cities like Gdansk for pay raises. And so, it, again, it push, they, we're seeing organized resistance much like we saw during the Cold War in Hungary or Czechoslovakia against the Soviet-backed regime. So this is causing consternation, which we'll come back to. Um, at the same time, we obviously have uh, Reagan elected in 1980 and then takes over in January of 1981, and then his CIA director, Bill Casey, who I, I think not only is anti-Soviet, but we, what, be, what becomes important are two other aspects for the story is one is he's Catholic. And that becomes very important because at this point we have a Polish Pope and we have uh, interest both from the senior levels of the Catholic Church and from the US government, including CIA, that both of those organizations have the same end goal in Poland, which is uh, encouraging solidarity and democracy to establish more of, a, of an underpinning than they had had. Reagan, while he's not Catholic, although his father was Irish Catholic, uh, Reagan is, is, uh, survives an assassination attempt, as you probably remember, right around the time that the Pope, Pope John Paul II does, so they, they do have a, uh, a common bond, and we'll, we'll come back to the Catholic Church a little bit later. 
Um, what we now know CIA declassified assessments start to indicate over the course of late 1980 and 1981 is growing U.S. concern that uh, the Soviets are going to invade, and they're going to invade because of solidarity. And by the end of 1981, it's bad enough that Poland has uh, an organized opposition movement that is pushing for democratic reform. That's bad enough. What's even worse is they start encouraging other Eastern European uh, labor unions to organize in a similar fashion. And that crosses major lines for Moscow, because now you're starting to see these fissures start to um, widen among, uh, among and, and within in Europe. So, so uh, the, the, Moscow's got to make a decision here. Does it invade the way it had, it had done in Hungary or Czechoslovakia? Or does it, um, does it encourage, encourage is the word, pressure the Poles to do it themselves? And there's a lot of debate we can see now from declassified Soviet archives. The, the, uh, the Politburo makes a decision that's probably right at the time, which is a Soviet invasion of Red Army forces would have been probably catastrophic. They would have met with large-scale resistance within Poland, uh, and, and it was organized. So that may have been the Eastern European version of what had happened for them in Afghanistan. That's, I think, what they ended up calculating. So instead, they get the Poles to crack down. So what the Polish government does is it pushes tanks into the streets, this is a famous photograph of a, uh, an American photographer who took the picture under Apocalypse Now. It's, it's kind of an ironic <laughs> photo of a Polish tank in the street. And here are all of the detention centers across Poland where solidar Solidarity members were uh, taken and jailed. And now this movement is under major uh, duress. <coughs> its leader, Lech Wałęsa, is placed in a couple of different centers, including here. Um, and the it is, it is unclear, that happens in December of 1981, it is unclear by January and February of 1982 whether Solidarity will actually survive. And it's interesting to watch the US National Security Council debates because there are a couple of things going on at this point. One is, is that uh, you know, they take some immediate steps like sanctions. They sanction the Polish regime and they sanction the Soviets. They, they really have no impact and don't impact um, what's certainly what's going on in Poland or Moscow's cost benefits. They also begin to have a debate about uh, Yalta. And if you remember what happens in Yalta, uh, FDR and Churchill essentially, and this is the way the Soviets take it, um, allow the Soviets a sphere of influence in Eastern Europe. And, and we can see that in Poland because there's a debate about whether to have what's in London at that point, the Polish government in opposition, uh, run the country or whether Moscow will organize elections in Poland. Uh, the U.S. essentially cedes and the British cede Eastern Europe to a Soviet sphere of influence, and then, for the most part, over the next several decades, Eastern Europe is partially off limits to the U.S. The U.S. engages in competition with the Soviets in a range of places. So there's a discussion in the administration, we can see it in the declassified NSC debates at the time, for, us to, for the U.S. to conduct an action in Eastern Europe would mean we would have to essentially throw out what happened in Yalta and decide that there is no location in the world, including in Eastern Europe, where now we, we're gonna see the sphere of influence. So these are the debates that are, are, that are happening. And this gets us to uh, the 1982 discussions within the Reagan administration. But I think it's probably first helpful to highlight what starts to go on in solidarity, then back up to the strategy standpoint, and then look at the operational and tactical program that Reagan ends up supporting. <laughs> so uh, solidarity, even as it's during its darkest period of months in 1982, is still at its core a, an opposition movement. And its primary way to reach polls, its major constituents, is through newspapers and magazines that it publishes it's an illegal organization now, but it's publishing them in newspapers, uh, in shops like this. So this is, this is my photograph. It's a recreated basement 
uh, with hidden doors that get you in there. And you could see the materials in the Solidarity print shop that include duplicator machines, that include um, uh, any, any kind of material, including paper and ink cartridges that you need to run on the ground. Again, this is an information campaign designed to get information to polls that is being withheld by, by the government, which is a state-run media apparatus. So issues of corruption within the Polish government, you will never see that in state-run media. But, but that is one theme that Solidarity is publishing in their newspapers and magazines. You'll never see uh, controversial issues, but you'll see it in uh, Polish, um, Polish uh, Solidarity newspapers and magazines. Occasionally, you know, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty are able, BBC is able to broadcast in, but there's a constant back and forth uh, attempts to jam those signals. But I even talking to Alec Fowenza when he's in, uh, he's in uh, prison, I mean, it was, he was actually staying in a mansion, so it was not too bad, but is listening at various points when he can get access to it to Radio Free Europe, Europe Radio Liberty. So polls are looking for all kinds of sources for information other than just what the state is is uh, is dedicated to making sure that they get. So this is kind of the state of play. One of the things that the administration does, and I think is smartly, is through some of its national uh, security decision directives, is it puts information on the same playing field as military, diplomatic, and other instruments of American power. And recognize that the Soviets have done the same directive measures, which is what we looked at earlier, that they need now to do the same thing. So it, it uh, authorizes a range of information programs. And then and this is NSDD 54 on US policy towards Eastern Europe. It shelves historically the uh, decision to cede influence in Eastern Europe to the Soviets and said it is now open game uh, that if we make a decision to support an opposition movement in Poland, uh, that we're gonna, we're gonna do that. So what the administration does is debate in 1982 and then authorizes in November of that year a covert action program to provide assistance to solidarity. Now there are a couple of things weighing on this decision. One of them is, do you provide lethal material that the US was providing to the Afghan Mujahideen, which was a war, uh, or does you, do, do, you, do you keep it non-lethal? And, and obviously, I think this was, there was a debate, but not a real difficult one. At its core, as we saw earlier, this is a political movement. It needs funding and is asking for funding uh, to run a new, newspapers, magazines, and ultimately a radio station, and, and the ability to break into television newscasts, which it does. That's what it needs. It doesn't need weapons. So this becomes a political covert action program as opposed to um, a, a, a paramilitary one. Do you do a covert program or an overt program? I think the challenge here was um, concerns right off the bat of directly uh, attributing assistance coming in to Poland to the United States at a time where the solidarity was already under such duress, the administration makes a decision that it would likely undermine the legitimacy of solidarity to tie them from the beginning to US assistance. Uh, so it makes a decision at that point to uh, make it covert and to, to uh, authorize, the president authorizes a, a CIA finding along these lines. Uh, there's also a, dis a logistical challenge in how to get that material to polls without it, it through surrogate means, which, which you'll see what I mean by uh, in a moment. Um, before getting to the tactics of the program, I think what's important to understand is when the U.S. makes its decision on supporting solidarity, the objectives are very minimal. They're not to overthrow the government in Poland. Uh, they, they are very simply to make sure that um, the group survives and that they can exert more pressure to begin to open up Polish society. But the objectives are pretty minimal. Um, and certainly what happens at the end of the 1980s was, at least in the early 80s when this program is to be, being debated, 
Um, those objectives of um, elevating solidarity to the government, overthrowing the Yaroslavsky regime, I think as folks debating the issue in 1981 and 1982 recognized that uh, they needed to keep objectives pretty minimal. And again, it was just about helping solidarity survive and to open up the regime. Uh, so when the finding happens and we start to see, uh, and I think this is why covert action program in this case was, was I think the appropriate kind of program to put together is how do you get the material into, into Poland? What, again, what, what they need is printer cartridges, duplicator machines, ink, paper, stuff to get an opposition movement and a printing presses going to make sure those newspapers and magazines get delivered. And the, the polls are doing all the organizing and they're getting, they just need <laughs> means with which to do it. They had some, uh, but they needed, they really needed money and they, they needed a lot more duplicators if they were to reach the, their labor unit. They, they, they were about 10, 10 million members of Solidarity, illegal, but 10 million members plus a lot more that were reading their material. So what it meant was, um, much like the US never created Solidarity to begin with, they worked directly with an organization that already existed. In this case, they didn't invent the rap lines that got material into Poland, they used pre-existing rap lines. So one of the individuals here was a, a Pole who had relocated just before martial law from Poland into Paris. Uh, he went by the cryptonym QR Guide, and Guide had already been running a major operation to, get, to try to get uh, ink and printer cartridges into Solidarity hands from France. There was a notable uh, Polish expat community in the, in the suburbs of Paris. And so he had already actually had a pretty proven ability to get that material into the hands of, of Solidarity members in Poland. So the US then, uh, CIA reaches out to uh, and works with recruits uh, a, a small number of these individuals involved in, in smuggling uh, information. And it's not all by land. Some of it's originating in cities like Paris and Turin, but some of it's also going from Hamburg up into uh, Oslo or Malmo or Stockholm and then coming in by sea into Poland. So just think for a moment if you're putting uh, this is an example of a couple of du duplicator machines getting put into a, a, a truck that was used to bring milk cartons. So it had a freezer area, and there was a false compartment that would hide four or five duplicator machines that when stuff was unloaded uh, or loaded, it would be difficult to find unless you had intelligence that they were transporting illegal materials. So stuff might get loaded in Paris, and then get moved to Brussels, in which case you would often get a new truck driver who would then move the materials by <coughs> truck to Hamburg, and then, uh, and then would, with the tier trucking system, with some uh, trucks had been pre-approved to move across from Western to Eastern Europe. So that they might then move from Hamburg to Berlin, Berlin, Berlin to Gdansk, in which case they might actually be offloaded, but that's not the end goal. Uh, it's to get into an underground shop in uh, somewhere in the outskirts, let's say in Gdynia, which is, uh, which is up here. So from the time it moves to Paris to the time it gets to the shop in Gdynia, it's gone through seven different or eight different people. So what CIA does is uh, makes sure that if anybody's captured along the way, no one's going to have any idea of the origins of the material. There is never, I, I, I think, or almost never, a case where any of the case officers were involved in uh, sitting down and exchanging money or material with a member of Solidarity. It was all done through surrogates that were already involved in moving black market uh, goods into Poland. And in fact, in some cases, in Brussels, for example, uh, the Solidarity office there was so heavily penetrated by KGB and Polish security services that the decision was made, you know, not only would, would it, 
potentially delegitimize solidarity, but from a counterintelligence standpoint, it would be extremely dangerous to work with solidarity directly in some of these locations in Western Europe because they were so heavily penetrated. So it runs its operations through surrogates. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I think it almost had to be the case. Now, in addition to the material, there were also other things going on. There were demonstrations during every year uh, in the middle of December. There were demonstrations about the anniversary of martial law. And they're not just happening in Europe, but with uh, U.S. assistance, this, this guy, Mexico City is not in the middle of the United States. <laughs> um, uh, Mexico, Mexico City at the station there helps organize demonstrations. So there is some U.S. assistance that is, uh, that is helping out uh, demonstrations in other parts of the, of the world. Um, around this, around the 83-84 period, though the KGB and the, and the Polish security services can't actually identify a case officer giving uh, money or goods to a member of Solidarity, they can certainly see there is a lot more stuff coming into Poland to aid the underground. So they now make a concerted effort to start uh, capturing it. Now, they can't prove, and I think even in the declassified uh, that, that either declassified or stolen is with the Matrokin archives, uh, KGB insights during this period, they never had definitive information about US assistance to solidarity, they just had hunches. But you can see what they're, what they're capturing. Uh, leaflets from solidarity posters, copies of journals and books, offset presses, Xerox machines, duplicators, silkscreen frames, typewriters, uh, papers, uh, reams, of, reams of papers, these are all the elements that go into an underground. And, and so I think you know, what you can start to see is, the, is the, 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 the KGB is really concerned about, uh, about this information campaign, that it is undermining, um, undermining their legitimacy in Poland. At the same time, there is this question, and in some of the secondary sources, right at the end of the Cold War, there are a couple of big books on the Pope John Paul II. And there, there is this narrative that starts to appear after the Cold War <coughs> finishes of a holy alliance between the uh, CIA and the Catholic Church uh, that was involved in this program or something like it to get assistance to solidarity. So part of what I was curious about was did this Holy Alliance stand up to certainty. What the evidence suggests in what we can find in declassified U.S. archives, or talking to members of the underground, or uh, other sources of information, uh, interviews that I, I had with uh, case officers involved in this. And it turns out that much of the Holy Alliance was a myth. But I'll tell you what was what ends up looking like it was the case. There certainly was a lot of conversation between U.S. officials at this time and the, and the Pope and other Catholic officials. And they certainly had the same end goal of supporting solidarity. And, uh, and the church allowed a lot of solidarity meetings in churches in Poland. They did provide help in making sure the, this uh, material, ink cartridges and printers got into the hands of solidarity members and they facilitated it. But there were other avenues for getting that in. The, the program here that goes by the cryptonym Cure Helpful was a CIA program done with a little bit of British awareness, MI6 awareness, but for the most part was a US program, not worked at the operational or tactical level with the Catholic Church. There were a few occasions where priests, unbeknownst to them, had taken money for solidarity, they weren't priests. Generally, weren't checked at borders when they came into Poland. Um, so, at least unwittingly, unwittingly, in the sense of that this was CIA money they were bringing in, uh, uh, were participating. But that was a tiny amount. In fact, what ends up happening is the Catholic Church, in general, gives a major boost to this influence campaign. In particular, in the late 1980s, when this is the Pope making a conscious decision uh, to go to Gdansk, which is the home of Lech Wałęsa, and literally the home of Lech Wałęsa. This is the apartment complex that he lived in at the time. So he, in front of 
a massive audience that's included on television outlines his support for solidarity. So you see a covert U.S. program, and then as you go through the 1980s, you see the church really step up its support to uh, solidarity members. In this particular speech, he uses the word solidarity uh, you know, almost a half dozen times in the period of about two minutes. And he had been on his previous visit banned by the regime for mentioning um, solidarity at all during his speech. And he generally adhered to that, though he did meet with Owenso. So the church becomes uh, an important actor as well. Uh, there are a couple of things that CIA assistance also does. Uh, you know, these might be a little controversial, but I'll explain the rationale. One is uh, there are somewhat free and fair elections in 1989. They're not really ele they're not really free and fair. The government controls all the major media outlets, uh, legal ones including radio. So there is some U.S. help in providing. Uh, the same kinds of material so that uh, Solidarity can put its poster boards up for election individuals. Now, Solidarity does all of its work and does all the printing and puts them up, uh, so that's not done with U.S. help. But some of the printer board, you know, some of the funds the U.S. provides are used for that. The other thing, it, just in, as, as an example, and, and this is where the issue became dicey for CIA lawyers, is if there was funding used for a a poster like this, this is, those of you who don't recognize uh, this, this is Gary Cooper at High Noon with CIA money that had, had been provided a little bit to help out with these campaigns. There was a problem that uh, Gary Cooper in the actual photograph of this um, has a six shooter. And remember, this was not a lethal program. This was a non-lethal political program designed to help Solidarity run underground. So Gary Cooper had CIA lawyers insured, had to be carrying a ballot as opposed to a six shooter. <laughs> so he's wearing the solidarity, he's, he's wearing the uh, solidarity pin there, and he's got Solidarność on the back. Now this this was still all organized by um, uh, by polls and by solidarity. There was just a little bit of U.S. funding that, that went along with this. And so uh, as we get into late 1989, Solidarity does well uh, in the elections. Lech Wałęsa comes at the end of 1989 to, um, to the U.S. It's worth, if you pull this up on YouTube, watching Lech Wałęsa address a pact, uh, both um, mem members of the House and Senate of the United States. And as he comes down the aisle to give his joint session, there are members of Congress on both sides of the aisle weeping because it is such an emotional experience that this organization that was nearly banned, well, it was banned, but nearly defeated and uh, eliminated in 1982 is now on its way to what happens the next year, and that is to becoming the uh, government. So, like for once, uh, by 1990, uh, goes from uh, legal organization in 80 to a banned organization by the end of 81 and being imprisoned and by 1990 uh, emerges as the um, leader of the organization. Based on time, I'm actually going to leave the last section aside for the moment and I'm just going to offer a couple of concluding remarks. So if we take a step back, we have here a CIA program that uh, provided covert assistance to a political opposition group in Poland. How do we assess the impact of that assistance? It's a difficult question to answer, and it's one I don't think we can ever entirely answer. But I will just say a couple of things, having looked at this and trying to put together the funding streams. Um, one of the things I think that made this a helpful US program was that in the early stages, just after martial law, this is the largest, by far, uh, source of assistance coming into solidarity uh, anywhere in the world. The AFL-CIO is providing a limited amount of assistance to solidarity, but the amounts of money, we can put this together, coming to solidarity from CIA, which is the way the US decides to send it, is, is by far the largest. And that goes to about 85 or 86, 
when the U.S. shifts to mostly overt sources of assistance like the National Endowment for Democracy. So uh, I think what, what this does is it provides a way to help solidarity survive. Um, I think also the, the concern, significant concern, and the substantial resources provided by the KGB and Polish security to um, prevent this assistance from coming indicates at the very least that the Soviets and the Poles and other Eastern European intelligence agencies, including uh, in Czechoslovakia and East Germany, were deeply concerned about this program and the potential for it to be directed at other countries in Eastern Europe. So we, ga we, we can gauge that the Soviets were deeply concerned about this to such a degree where KGB officers, by the end of the 80s, are saying essentially, uh, you know, we were ahead in the information war with active measures in the 80, 81 period. By the end of the 80s, uh, we've clearly lost this uh, war of ideas. And we've lost it in Poland, and we've lost it in other places. A couple other things just to highlight. Um, you know, one, one of the interesting components is that this was a covert action program that uh, never had to organize anything from scratch. It was just tapping into an already existing legitimate movement in Poland, which I think helped. And, and also didn't even have to create its rat lines to get uh, material into Poland. It leveraged already existing smuggling routes. So I, I think the way it was designed, the way it was executed, the fact that it, it didn't create anything it simply leveraged what already existed and what was legitimate among the Polish population certainly helped to contribute to it. So as I take a look at this program, I would say, you know, in general, it had, I, I think, highly likely an important impact on the survival of solidarity. Obviously, by the end of the 1980s, there are a lot of other factors that are going into solidarity emerging as the government, including uh, the emergence of Gorbachev, the institution of Glasnost and Perestroika, the collapse of communism in other countries. But I think this is one interesting case where the U.S. administration recognizes that information warfare is an important avenue of competition, and then it decides from a strategic all the way down to a tactical level to go on the offensive. And to do it, in this case, in a way that is done to support oppos democratic opposition movements. Uh, as, as Reagan saw it at that point, uh, that were in many ways, you can agree or not with this, but in many ways, as he saw it, not too dissimilar from the way the US uh, was founded by an opposition movement under George Washington that was to try to throw off um, British, uh, British control. So this is the story of QR Helpful. I am happy to take questions on this or even current implications uh, today. One other thing before going uh, to, to questions too is this is also a case where uh, I think after enough time goes by with the declassification process, things start to come to light. And I think, you know, in the U.S., whether it's the military, the intelligence community, or, or other governments, sometimes it's a, it's a bad news story. You know, uh, the Nicaragua controversy in the 1980s was certainly a, uh, problematic, including mining a Central American harbor that was controversial. I think in this case, you know, there's stuff that comes to light that uh, I, I would say actually ended up being helpful to a, to a uh, democratic opposition movement. Yeah. Yeah, I was just going to point to the uh, complementarity of a lot of things the United States did over a long period of time and how there's overt activities, there's covert activities, and there's my old employer, Radio Free Europe, which was somewhere in between. It was covert in the sense that it was operating freely in Munich. Yeah. Uh, and I was there from 79 to 84. But it was a sort Bob, of... Bob was in third grade at the time, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> I was already an old man then. Yeah. Um, yeah. uh, so it's... Yeah, sort of a domestic station, and it had been ex in existence since the early 50s. Yeah. So broadcasting 20, 20 an hour, one hours a day and building up a kind of a reputation that you don't acquire 
overnight. You right. require over decades. And I think that, together with sort of the blitz that the Reagan administration put on with its covert programs inside Poland under martial law, were what made it so, so effective. Solidarity under the conditions of martial law now had capacity, thanks to these programs. And then that, that, those reports got smuggled out to Munich, went too hard. We broadcast them through Radio Free Europe, so they reached not a few hundred or a few thousand people, but millions of yeah. people. So it's the combination of all of these things which was so effective. Yeah, no, I think there's no question about that. It's Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, there's a Voice of America component to it. Uh, there was the television shows that Reagan had authorized from some of, some of his Hollywood friends, including Frank Sinatra, that were uh, encouraging support to the Polish people. Um, the uh, Polish ambassador around time martial law defects to the United States, and he's brought publicly in front of the U.S. population with the American president to highlight someone who's just defected because he thinks that what was done in Poland was was a terrible step to put Polish troops on. And that's got, that's, that's, there's an influence component to bringing someone like that out with the American president and putting him out publicly. There's, there's, the, U, there's the US president at that time writing letters publicly to solidarity members, solidarity members in prison. I think a range of these steps from Radio Free Europe to Radio Liberty. Now there are two elements that I didn't mention much earlier but are also going on with this um, covert action program. One, one is <coughs> providing technical assistance to help get a radio program up and running, which Solidarity needed. So there's the radio component. The other is some technical help in, um, they didn't run a television station, but what Solidarity did with US assistance was uh, develop the technical capabilities to break into the evening news so if you were in, a, in an area, they, they couldn't do this across the country at one time, but they could do it in specific areas. If you're watching the evening news with a Polish anchor on Polish state-run television, you might see this banner that comes across the top of the newscast that says, Solidarity Lives, and it goes across the screen, and then has another banner that tells you which radio frequency to listen to radio solidarity so so it was hitting people in print media on radio and then on television yeah I was wondering as you got into the declassified material what did you find that either surprised you the most or most changed your perspective on the problem I one of the things that I I, I don't know if it was surprising per se that it was going on, but I did not fully appreciate, well, two things. One is I did not fully appreciate how concerned, I'd never read anything on this, how concerned the Soviets were about uh, an offensive US information effort in Eastern Europe. And, and it was, you know, it was interesting the way, the Soviets aren't quite putting it in this way. I, I'm sort of paraphrasing and putting it in my, I think they recognized they were vulnerable because they were a state-run state run media and state-run systems. They recognized there were problems politically and economically. And so an information campaign that was designed to get information to their populations, including in this case Poland, was viewed as deeply concerning. So I think one thing that I, I'll, I'll say surprised me to, a little, to, to some degree, at least in the amount, is how concerned they were and the resources they devoted on the counterintelligence side to try to penetrate the system. Although, you know, it is amazing, and it, it's an interesting question about how, what the implications would be for them. How do you run a covert action program like this today and keep it as secret as the U.S. did? It is amazing how, th there were some stories and there occasionally were newspaper articles, but there was no evidence um, that that uh, you know no evidence of of an individual who had been captured that had gotten assistance from the CIA directly because it generally didn't happen. You would have had to go to France to start arresting people. Um, but but that that was certainly one one thing that was uh, surprising. I think a second thing that I found surprising was. Um, how, just how uh, 
methodical this administration was in, from the strategy perspective, in reshaping its national security decision directives uh, and legal, authorizing information warfare, the, probably that may be too strong, but, the in, but information as a tool of American foreign policy uh, all the way down to the tactical level. So it took Reagan's comments um, and all the way down to the tactical level that it was a, it was a, you know, there were problems obviously like you'd expect with <coughs> any administration running, but it was a, from the strategy down to the tactical level, uh, at least with this program, there was a lot going on. So, uh, you know, in talking to the, the individual running the program from Langley, uh, they were very well aware, even though he never briefed the president on it, he was very well aware of the, the president's views on this issue and what their program was doing were in sync. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This was so interesting. Uh, I really appreciated the, the kind of definition of active measures, something that takes a life of its own. So looking at the current implications of Russian active measures, whether it's through the findings in the Mueller report or whether it's through Russian action in the Middle East, where are we seeing some of those active measures that are kind of taking on a life of their own now? Yeah, I, I think uh, this, is, this is a good, a good uh, question. And I, I defer on what's been happening in Texas to experts, other experts in the room. But I, I think, you know, I, I think the problem, and I think it's a problem, of the way the current debate has happened in the U.S. is it's, it's been, the debate has now happened on political grounds, been polarized. That the the reality is that the the Russian Russian intelligence and what, one of the things that's interesting is uh, is we've gone the GRU the military intelligence during this period was involved a little bit in this kind of stuff they're now heavily involved so some of the Russian organizations involved in this we've seen a, a little bit of an evolution uh, but but I I think what many people need to realize is the Russians consider us their main adversary. Mm -hmm. And that they, they also consider uh, our, one of our primary vulnerabilities is, uh, is our, uh, the, the availability of, of information in, in the American system and the polarized nature of our politics right now. So what it's meant is that when you see Russian intelligence campaigns at the moment, um, this is not entirely just about supporting one candidate over another. This is about sowing discord. So what we've seen in declassified assessments of Russian operations is that they are on not one side, but all sides of Me Too movement, of uh, gun control, of uh, Black Lives Matter. This is an effort, if we go back to the early goals of active measures, they, they are still, in my view, largely the same. And that is, their goals are to find ways and conduct operations that benefit Moscow and that undermine the US and its allies. So that means weakening us internally, weakening our relationship with allies. So active measures in this sense, if they can, if they can through specific targeted active measures campaigns, get information out that takes on a life of its own uh, about candidates or, or, uh, or issues, that is the modern version of active measures. And I think actually the way that the Russian campaign, even for the 26th election, has gone down, I, I would suspect there were people being awarded <coughs> stars for their service because what they have is an America that's responded not by uniting together against uh, against someone that's been trying to manipulate, but as we're focused on each other right now, which I'm sure is what they had hoped might come out. Of so, yeah. Uh, Seth, this is great. Two two questions. And by the way, I have read the book, so I highly recommend it to everybody here. So please buy buy a copy. Um, one on your research for the book. I know you based it both on a lot of archival research, these newly declassified documents, and then interviews with the, the case officers, the um, CIA folks who were who were running it. Just love to hear your thoughts on what did you uh, what did you learn from from both those? Did you ever find that you were getting one thing from the interviews that that, that was different from what you were getting in the documents? Uh, so. And the second question is. Um, 
Uh, was there consistent bipartisan support for this program throughout the years in Congress? Because I know, say, the Central America stuff was very partisan and, and divided, you know, the Boland Amendment and so on and so forth, uh, whereas the Afghanistan one, uh, the covert action had quite a bit of bipartisan support. So was there bipartisan support and the, you know, the intelligence uh, uh, committees for this? So, yeah, uh, good questions. So I, I actually, on the archives, I actually started out with the material that had made its way through the CIA's review board, mm -hmm. so the Gates book, Mm -hmm. uh, which mentions the Polish program. Um, the, uh, there's an article by uh, Ben Fisher. Mm -hmm. There's a, uh, and there's, there's a couple of other books that have made its way through the PRB. Mm -hmm. uh, so I judge that they were, uh, you know, largely factual and that they were then allowed to sit. So I started off there. Then when I went to the archives, I started piecing together um, more specific information, including debates that had been declassified in the National Security Council, intelligence reports on the Polish situation and the Soviet situation, uh, used some secondary uh, resources, uh, got help from the CIA's um, Crest database, uh, declassified database, which is mostly online now. And then at that point, after having, if, 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 if this is a table here and I've dumped a box of, uh, of a puzzle on here, I've got enough pieces together, got a lot of holes missing, where I, one is I kind of have the outlines of what happened. Um, and second, I know the areas or some of the areas that I'm missing information. So at that point then I can start to uh, conduct interviews and start to fill those in, in part from the interviews or in part from uh, people pointing me to, oh, did you look here, did you look here? I hadn't actually been to the Casey Archives mm -hmm. at Stanford. They were a little bit helpful. AFL-CIO was also helpful to some degree. So it's starting to, to follow other other um, bits of information. Your second question? Bipartisan support. Oh. So uh, <coughs> there's not a lot of at least declassified reactions from members of uh, either House or Senate Intelligence. What I was, what I was able to get access to, look at, or read otherwise was um, bipartisan support for the program for the reasons I laid out. Uh, that is, there were so it was support for you know for aiding a, a, a labor union from the Democratic side and support from Republicans because it was targeting a Soviet-backed regime. However, when you backed off on that, anyone in Congress or in the political establishment that was not read under the program, which was almost everybody, criticized uh, Reagan from their uh, specific standpoint. So there were Republicans who believed that the US administration was not doing enough in Poland. It was sanctioning and nothing else. In reality, there was also a covert action program going on that they did not know about, that Reagan's not gonna tell them about. So he's taking it on the chin for not being tough enough and providing direct assistance, because people said to him, you need to provide assistance to solidarity. You're not doing that. And so we have these memos from his national security advisor to the president showing him you know, a lot of abuse from the Republican side for not doing enough. And then we see the same thing uh, from the Democratic side. So I say where he gets, where, where the administration gets most of its criticism are people who aren't entirely aware of what's going on. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, first point of clarification, then a uh, uh, question. But uh, you know, when you mentioned the U.S. as the main enemy, everybody uh, wants to think, well, of course, the U.S. is the main enemy. But uh, clarification comes from Kennan's chapter in Russia and the West under Lenin and Stalin. That Britain was the Soviet target in the 1920s. Yeah. So that changed. But the question I have is uh, regarding the. Uh, applicability of these issues to today, are we looking at positive lessons to be learned from helping solidarity literally survive, okay, low set goals, that would be number one. Number two, how, how rapidly the KGB lost the information edge from the beginning of the 1980s to the end of the 1980s, as you mentioned, they were lamenting that. Uh, you know, can can we draw any lessons from from how 
rapidly we might be able to turn around the information situation today, for example, with this rancor uh, on a partisan basis. And then number three would be the advantages of tapping into an already existing system. So can you comment on the, please, on the, on the uh, applicability of those uh, key points today? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I think there, I mean, the speed is a tough one. There are a lot of variables that may impact the speed of a campaign that may be in part out of hands of any U.S. government or allied government agency. Uh, I think part of the speed, as you look at the mid-1980s in this period here, is that the, uh, the, the Gorbachev coming to power in the Soviet Union and instituting political and economic reforms were variables outside of our control that contributed to the speed with which uh, the U.S. began to shift the information campaign. But I, I think there are a couple of, uh, of issues that I would say are worth noting. On the, on the legitimate actor side, and, and, e and even on the broader point of um, you know, how the US thinks about this today, I, I think one of the challenges, and this has begun to change a little bit, is it took, it took a couple of decades, I think, despite NSC 68, despite even Kennan's own work on political warfare, I still think, as you look, let's say, in the 1970s, and I had talked to uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski about this before he passed away, uh, he had a hard time uh, moving on. I mean, he characterized most of his administration and Carter as the focusing on Tatan. So the idea that the US was going to take risks in going on the offensive against the Soviets, including on the information uh, realm, and including in Eastern Europe, was a risk that most people in the administration were not willing to take. And while he may have supported more activities along these lines, um, uh, did, did not have support in the administration. I think what we see is, is uh, that a if you're going to really take a competitor on like this, on the information space, you cannot just play defense. Mm -hmm. And I, I think one lesson that I take, especially with the Soviet reaction, is once they recognized we were going on the offense, and that offense <coughs> meant um, targeting their vulnerabilities in state-controlled media uh, systems. I mean, look at, look at Chinese or Iranian society today. Uh, they, they, the internet systems are state-controlled. And look at how many even Silicon Valley companies are, including Facebook, are blocked from individuals. You know, we have societies like that that uh, do not have access, or their people do not have access to information. So the tools today may be a little different from what they were, but I think there's an interesting question about what trying to open up societies to those about what, they're, what else is going on in the world. Uh, what is, uh, what's their regime doing? The Soviets have been involved in massive corruption, uh, human rights abuses in a range of places, uh, you know, the Olympic scandals. How much of that, how much of that kind of information is getting to Chinese populations or, or Iranian populations? So I think there's a question about what going on the offense looks like in this realm. Um, but I think as we saw with the Soviet reaction, they feel they felt extremely vulnerable to an offensive campaign along those lines. And just uh, to pin you down, already existing systems. In, in what in what sense? Well, there was the benefit, big benefit to the to the uh, CIA. So. Oh, so you, this, you mean of having, having solidarity we, in place? Yeah. Yeah. So is this a lesson that we can bring forward? Yeah. I, well, what I think it what I think it means one has to be careful about is trying to orchestrate something <laughs> from scratch. If you're looking at supporting an opposition movement, building something from scratch is, I, want, I would say, one has to be real careful. If you're talking about aiding an already existing opposition movement in country X, Y, or Z, or, or expats in another country willing to help out, that's one thing. Creating something from scratch, that's a very, I think one has to be real uh, cautious on those lines, yeah. Uh, do you think we're now in a new Cold War with Russia? And if so, how does that play out in Eastern Europe today? It looks like on their own, Poland and Hungary are kind of moving in a much more authoritarian direction without any 
east-west implications. And of course, we now know that Ukraine just elected a Canadian and almost yeah. I think the easiest way to answer that question is if you if you look at how Moscow speaks about this, and you look at Gerasimov's most recent um, article on on uh, Russian uh, warfare. Uh, the Russians are in a modern Cold War right now. Are we in a Cold War? So Moscow is Washington. I don't know. I think it depends on who you ask. My sense is that much of the US government feels that way, but not everybody. And I don't know about the American population. Uh, I, 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 what, what's disturbed me about the reaction to even the Mueller report is how much the focus has been internal <coughs> rather than external in what has gone on. And that makes me wonder whether we actually view this that the national security strategy of the United States and the national defense strategy of the United States both argue matter-of-factly that Russia is a competitor. And so in that sense, U.S. strategy says that. But whether we act like that or whether people believe that, I think is an open question, and I think the Russians certainly do. You had a, a Follow-up? Well, how does it play out like in Eastern Europe? Like, oh, it looks like Poland. Is yeah, I, well, I think look at look at how the Russians have I think taken advantage of this. I, you know, I don't think we have certainly been offensive. I don't think we've been aggressive. Not like this period that we're talking about here. I think it, what it's allowed the Russians here to do is uh, there's been a lot of covert assistance going to parties and not just ones that are necessarily sympathetic to Moscow per se, but ones that I think they can encourage. Uh, disorder, but we see Hungary going in a direction of state-run media. Um, we've seen we've seen Russian, even outside of that, we've seen significant increases in Russian activity in Libya. Uh, Russians have provided assistance to the Taliban in Afghanistan, not a lot, but that's that's an organization the U.S. is fighting. Uh, Russians have notable power projection capabilities now from Syria, from Tartus, the naval base in Latakia. So I think we're, they, they are positioning themselves for, you know, you can overstate Russian power. It's certainly nothing, I think, like Chinese right now. But, um, but I think they see this as a competition. And we, my view, have not fully embraced that. Yeah. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, last week we heard from Colonel Collins from the War Institute at West Point, and yes. he made the point that maybe the best way to deter Russian aggression is to increase their front end costs by making more cost effective choices in our aid to Ukraine. Do you think QR helpful has any implications for what we're doing in that theater? Or like what lessons can be taken and implemented in a much more complex zone? Yes, interesting question. Um, well, so, so Ukraine is a case where uh, if you read Gerasimov's most recent statement, they actually assess what the U.S. has been trying to do in Venezuela and what the U.S. did in Ukraine as examples of this. Uh, the Orange Revolution, some of the revolutions in Eastern Europe as being uh, manufa either manufactured or heavily influenced by the U.S. Uh, so they, you know, their argument is we've already done that to some degree. I think it would be very damaging for Ukraine to go back into the Russian orbit, particularly if it moves down an authoritarian road. So it's opened itself up. Uh, there are certainly problems of corruption in Ukraine, including in the military. But I, I would say if the US can help um, uh, Ukraine continue to, I'm not talking about NATO expansion, but I'm talking about if the US can help uh, Ukraine deal with its challenges, including with the Donbass region, and continue to improve its governance structure so that it stays on this road. I think that that is at least uh, helpful in this competition. If we see it start to backslide the way um, the Russians would like to see it, and I think you're starting to see the balance of power start to shift. This is probably our last question. All right, right in the middle. Um, thank you. Um, earlier you talked about a little bit about um, like these information campaigns that are clearly meant to just sow chaos and confusion and stuff like that. Um, and I feel like that's typically what people talk about when they talk about uh, like Russian influence. 
Um, but I'm thinking along the lines of like financial um, aspects of Russian influence, especially in Europe. Um, I know CSIS did like the Kremlin playbook to yep, stuff. Yep. Um, how should we think about countering that? And should we lump that together with these kind of disinformation campaigns or is it something totally different? Or like how, how do we really think about that aspect of it? I think, <coughs> I mean, I leave it there. Others here are experts on the Russians and more knowledgeable than I am. But just having looked at this a little bit and dealing with Heather Connolly on the Russian playbooks one and two, um, you know, my own sense is that one has to look at these as being elements of a broader uh, strategy and policy. So active measures, even, even in this context, was one aspect of a broader effort to influence in ways that benefit Moscow and undermine Washington. And that did include economic assistance, economic warfare, military assistance, and other diplomatic efforts. So I think one has to, uh, one has to include competition. And, and there, there are avenues for cooperation. I mean, let's, let's not forget here that even in this, the Reagan administration, which is what we're talking about here, uh, they reached arms control deals with the Soviets. So none of this means that it's entirely competition on everything. But, uh, but uh, e uh, economic <coughs> issues can be used as leverage for influencing by that could be gas pipelines, that can be money to political parties. Um, th those are elements of, uh, of influence. Uh, so I would pull together all of these aspects. Yeah, well Military, I'm thinking about like others. in the Kremlin and playbook too, it talked about like 13% of the Netherlands GDP moves with like Russian money. And yep. I'm just like, that's, that's a, a really, I mean, I feel like that's, that's influence, though. Yeah. That's how this game is played. So, thank you. Thank you.